Hello there again everyone and welcome back to ART's Real Repairs for Real Customers. This is part two of Saving the Gulf Stream, where our mission is to simply do what any craftsman would do. Use correct products, proper techniques, and take the time to do it right. Nothing special here. What is remarkable though, is that because of scratches in one panel of one seat bottom, someone dyed all the leather in the aircraft. In part one, we saw the shoddy workmanship and determined that all this would have to be stripped and all of the leather in the plane would have to be re-dyed. And it begs the question, how do you let somebody do this to a $14 million aircraft? Someone did a superb sales job but didn't know what they were talking about and then failed to deliver. So we got started on the stripping of the seats in part one and now in part two we're going to be mixing our color. You know the drill, let's get to work. This is a big job and will require lots of color. How much? Well, experience tells me that for this size job I need probably at least a quart, that is 32 ounces of mixed color. I like to use a takeout soup container. Just be sure to run it through the dishwasher. That gives you a good excuse to get some Tom Kha Gai and maybe even some Singha while you're at it. Six Dixie cups of five ounces each would almost give us our quart. We could try to achieve our target color by mixing the pigments in one of the Dixie cups all the way full. We could add five cups of clear base and therefore our pigment would be one of six or 16%. If we added four cups of clear base then our pigment would be one of five and we would have a 20% mixture. So then logically, an 18% target would be four and a half cups of clear. So this should help us to get a visualization of how much product is going to be involved here and getting a quart of color. Our target is the original leather color from what must have been a hidden part of this drink rail. Now this is not a color matching video, but we will mention in passing, what we've done to achieve our color. In the tan family, of course, we use white and dark brown as our value controller. Yellow oxide is our main color. And if we wanted to lean just a little bit towards the orange side of things, we could add a drop of red or even the reddish brown. So that's what we've done here. And since it's only raw pigment on the stick, what you see is what you get. Once I have the pigment in the ballpark, it's time to add some clear base to it. Adding the clear base will distribute the pigment particles better and give us a truer look before adjusting further. But look, I've achieved my color match before I've got a full five ounces of pigment. What to do now? Just use a similar amount of clear in the cups. But now we've come up short of a quart. So what to do? We have to mix more pigment. Is that a source of anxiety when that happens to you? Well, this is the main reason for me wanting to share this video with you. It's a method I call wet on wet color matching and I know you'll like it. To do a comparison, dip your stir stick into the new color and then halfway into the true color you will see vividly, wet on wet, what the difference is. And in this case, our new color is a bit light. After a small adjustment, we can add that to our quart, agitate that, and do a test. And of course, it will dry some darker because our clear base is milky when wet, but when dried, turns crystal clear, revealing the actual true color of the pigments. The color is still a little bit light, and that's good because there is a backstory. Originally, it was proposed to change the whole interior 
to a light gray. However, when we discussed with the design department the extra cost incurred in dismantling the seats and in the extra time and materials it would take to change the color, it was decided that that was beyond budget. So the request was made, can we lighten and neutralize the color a little bit without incurring all the expenses of a color change? And of course the answer is yes. But first, let's look at a couple of examples of how you can use wet on wet color matching to your advantage. With an automotive job in the field, you have enough color in the gun for your final spray coat, but you need more paint to wipe in. You can compare wet on wet right in the gun. It's easy to see that a value adjustment with white is all that we need. This example is from an aircraft where we actually had to change the color of all of the plastic panels. Incidentally, the color is very similar to our other examples. But I can see I'm running out of color really fast. It's all the same pigments, so I'm going to throw them together like Julia Childs would throw a recipe together. While I'm stirring, I see right away I need more white for value and a little yellow for color. That looks much better, so let's mix in our base. So that amount of pigment makes this much paint. Now we can refine our color with a wet on wet drop test. It's so easy to discern that our color is still dark and white is the answer to bring our value lighter. So this is one of your best tools for large jobs such as the aircraft we're working on. There is a chance that you have underestimated the amount of color you need, or somebody brings you more parts than expected. Any anxiety you feel initially will just melt away because you're going to take two minutes to mix up a color and play the wet on wet color matching game. Then you're back to work with a good deal of confidence. Now back to our Gulf Stream. Our color is on the left. You can see it's lighter and less yellow, a more neutral color. So we're taking these down to the interior design department for approval. And when they compare them to their samples of material, they're extremely pleased. So now we've got work to do. Before coloring, we're going to prep with isopropanol. It serves two functions. One, it's hygroscopic, which means that it wants to absorb water. So after any cleaning with a water-based degreaser, it will absorb any residue and cause a drying out of the surface. And two, it has a relatively slow evaporation rate, which means that it affects the surface, opening it up, and leaving the surface tacky for the color coat. Normally, we wouldn't have to color the underside of the seat, but we have to erase what was done previously. That'll mean an extra day for these bottom seat cushions because we'll have to wait until tomorrow to turn them over. And of course, before straining the color into our gun, we have added Crosslinker for extra durability. Now it's the next day and we prep as previously. I like to process the bottom seat cushions first for two reasons. I have only 42 feet of work tables. So if I process these small parts first, I can store them out of the way on the workbench, which is 24 feet long. And the finish on these bottom seat cushions will have a longer time to cure. Since the parts that you sit on directly have more wrinkles, we actually push in the first color coat. Because as you could imagine, spraying into a recessed area is only met with air coming back out of the recessed area. But by wiping the color in, it's the hydraulic pressure that pushes the paint into the crease or into the seam or into the grain of the leather. So then the lines are hidden first, therefore requiring fewer sprayed coats to cover.
So now we're on to our first light spray coat. There are many facets to a seat design like this. So as a suggestion, try to follow a certain pattern throughout spraying each seat with the same sequence so that you don't miss any parts. When the first spray coat has dried, I will use 600 sandpaper to put a very nice smooth finish on before the second sprayed coat. After sanding, use a tack rag. Usually this contains isopropanol on one side but I wipe with the other side so it's only slightly damp and therefore picks up the sanding dust. Then it's a nice systematic second coat. Now it's time for the clear coat. You can match the clear coat, satin or matte finish, depending on what the original was. We didn't really have an original finish here to compare, so for this whole project, I'm just using a satin clear. The clear also contains a slip additive, which really adds to the nice feel of the seat. So in every aspect, we have duplicated the original coating. We took time to get a comparison shot here of our bottom seat cushion finished, a seat that was not stripped, and the original color under the headrest. Moving on to the main part of the seat, we have a little masking to do, so we're going to prep all the masking hardware with some acetone. After that dries, we will find uh, then and only then does our masking tape actually stick. And the rule is, the tighter the curve, the narrower the tape. So we're starting with half inch masking. The other rule should be, don't block the camera you just now set up. But then I've been forgetful for as long as I can remember. And we'll cover the wider areas with some two inch, or nearly two inch. I don't think this green is actually two. <laughs> then of course we always have some three quarter on hand to take care of any of the other spots. There are other things to mask as well, the seat belt up top and the rods that hold the headrest. And on the subject of masking, Sandy wanted me to show you this thing about uh, masking when you have to cut it, leave both ends long and that way when you put your knife uh, on the edge, you can pull the masking tape up. So there is never a need to cut downwards, perhaps ruining some leather. So for this day, we want to do this skirting that goes around the bottom seat cushion. 
So as you can see, we're holding that flap up. Instead of painting right over that flap like the previous ones did and leaving a line, there won't be any line left on that piece. Then of course, prepping and painting all the way around. The cardboard masking is just to prevent uh, putting too much paint over on the other parts. We will come back and wipe everything clean so there won't really be any evidence that there's any overspray there at all. The same is true on the aluminum bases. There are eight sides to every seat when you're painting. The four sides you're thinking about and the four corners you better hit directly on. After all, aren't the corners apt to be the most abused part? And then we move on to the arms and the recesses. That way these can be drying overnight we can move them tomorrow and proceed with the rest of the seat. Now we're continuing on in our promise to show one seat in its entirety. We're prepping on the next day here. Get us ready for painting. Notice we've put a drop cloth over top of the seat belts. You never want to paint on the seat belt webbing because you'll have another entire job there just trying to get that cleaned out. And if you did have to clean that out, it would be over top of all the fresh dye that you've already put on the leather. So you don't want to have that kind of a mess. And we're going to do the same with the backrest as we did on the bottom cushion. Because the way that they're used, they tend to get more wrinkles and creases. And we're using the hydraulic pressure of our paint to get down into those recesses. Again, with the spray coat, try to set up a method that you follow for every seat so that you don't miss anything. As before, we're using 600 grit on every area that we have actually wiped the dye in. And then following up with a tack rag. Coat number two. And followed up with our clear coat with the slip additive. Surprise! Sandy thought that demonstration mode wasn't good enough. She wanted to catch me in a full production mode. And as you can hear, we have the exhaust fan going as well. In fact, this whole shop was built expressly for processing airplane seats. And as such, we have physical inspections to make sure, among other things, that we don't set the seats on a hard surface that would damage the aluminum. Other considerations are that we have our burn certifications, 
We have our credentials renewed from year to year. We have our security clearance renewed every two years, as everyone has to have at the airport. And the next day, we found there's a part of the arm that's only visible when it's halfway down. Then it was time to move on to the drawer fronts, where it became obvious they had not previously replaced the LifeFest placards. And so when I see something is missing, I will send pictures to the crew chief, and he can expedite ordering the parts if they're needed. We took time early on to do the major repairs. But then as we get to processing the seats, some minor damages become visible. But as a suggestion, don't stop your big production days for the sake of a couple small repairs. Continue on in what I call pushing the project forward, then come back and touch up the small damages. So we finally got to the point of removing all of the masking. Something I've used here for the headrest post are some cardboard tubes that fabric comes on. I've cut them into about a four inch lengths and split them so that I can fit them right over top of the post. For the citations, one four inch length of cardboard tube is plenty, but here for the Gulf Stream, because the headrests are recessed, I'm using two of the four inch. We like to do our final inspection out in the sun because if you think you've got it, well, you probably don't. <laughs> Sandy can't do much for very long, but she really likes pitching in to help with this detailing. And since she enjoys it so much, I got her a little anniversary present this time. I think with any large job, it's a good idea to keep some leftover color on hand for several months, just in case there are any problems. I have had one airplane I thought was finished, but the mechanic put a slice right down the side of the seat as he was moving his tools. So having some color on hand really paid off. So I've managed to get everybody together for a group shot. We have the six cabin seats, we have the two-place divan, and we have the lavatory seat, which also serves as a jump seat. I've also got a little color I'm sending along in case they have problems on the installation. And also notice I don't have the two crew seats as they're being recovered separately. Everything fits in the cargo van nicely. And of course, I'm enjoying going down to the airport facility because there's just all kinds of great craftsmen at work. They are the absolute best in the business here. And though I try my hardest to make it a hostile work environment, they just smile and say, bring it on. Oh, and that thing about the anniversary present earlier, I was just kidding about that one. We didn't take all of three weeks to process the seats, but here it is three weeks later. They're ready to put the carpet in, and then our seats will be ready to go in. Well, that's about it, folks. Certainly, uh, doing a good job has its own rewards, doesn't it? I hope this is what you were looking for. I must have had a hundred requests for a video like this over the years, so here you go. So you see basically our approach to refinishing is based on sound principles rooted in good chemistry. I try to follow a logical, methodical method. I don't subscribe to the shortcut work and the quick dollar culture that really seems to be defining our industry today. And yet, to me, all I've done is to erase what the previous tech did and hand back the new seats to the owner. Simple as that. It is really craftsmanship that has proved victorious here. We've done what the aircraft deserves. We've given the owner what he or she deserves. And the main ingredient is to care, really. First, you have to care.